Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Southern Outdoorsman Podcast. Today, we're doing some listener Q&As, uh, which you can actually find in the show notes if you want to skip ahead to those or skip around to different parts of the podcast. Uh, Jacob, how are you doing? I'm doing well, man. Doing real well. Starting to get to really the time of the season here in Alabama where a lot of the state's starting to rut. So if you're in Alabama, Mississippi is the same way. Uh, it's getting really, really good for a lot of us. Yep, that's right. Uh, you're seeing a lot of other people out there kind of wrapping up their deer seasons right now. A lot so of people are, are coming down here right now to start hunting. Uh, but yeah, dude, uh, that's how it is on the hunting club right now. Um, it's more of like a January type rut, and, and we're recording this right here around Christmas. So we're starting to get more rutting activity. And by the way, and do what? Well, what, when this episode comes out, we're going to be on another hunt in Alabama. Yeah, we'll be in a different part of Alabama hunting other rutting deer yeah and then the week after that we're gonna go to a different part of alabama and hunt different rutting deer and then yeah oh. it's just gonna be a rut fest for, mm. from here on out january is a great month great yep. month. yeah it's gonna be a fun month for sure um so yeah we got we got that uh this monday we got to interview john boy holson back yeah. a guy who uh well, we've been say, trying to get on you say john boy but we call him jonathan the whole episode so now yeah. you're confusing the audience well, <laughs> well he got he, the man of many names uh, we've known him for a, a couple years now. I think we mentioned it in the episode that I, so I'd never met him before mm-hmm. or I, I'm, I probably did meet him at some point, like at the check station, mm-hmm. you know, before daylight or something, you know, everyone's waiting in line to get a permit back when you still had to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, so I probably have ran into him at some point, but just didn't really like remember. Uh, but the first time I ever had like, uh, like an encounter, like talk to him and everything mm-hmm. is when you shot a buck and how did you even link up with him? Like he just like came out of nowhere and helped you drag your buck out. Exactly. <laughs> so I, he just materialized out of the woods. Yeah, dude. It's See little, that guy's he's a little like, suspicious. Actually. He's like he's like the Mike. You know, we call Michael Pike the armadillo because mm-hmm. he uh, he's turned over every leaf in Alabama looking for big bucks. Yep. Uh, dude, that's how that's how Jonathan is on this particular W May. He is. He is the Michael Pike of this place. Yep. Like he, like you don't know it, and we know a couple guys like that actually. Nick Harris like that. Mm-hmm. Scott's like that. Uh, but like you, you can't. You're not going to a place he hadn't been to. Like no. he's he's been to all of it. No. And and that kind of reinforces like when I first got into public land hunting like years ago, I was always trying to find like that spot. I'm like, yeah, there's that no, nobody's nobody ever seen. Knows. That does not exist. I'm going to save everyone a lot of time. That doesn't exist. Yeah. Somebody knows about it 100% of the time. Just whether or not you can hunt when they're not there or, you know, maybe it's just not on the radar for that year. Yeah, yeah. That, because mm-hmm. every place I've ever hunted, I, we were, like, looking at the maps and stuff, actually on the podcast, you know, afterwards. He's like, oh, yeah, been there, been there, found a shed here, and they killed a buck there, this and that. I'm like, God, dude. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, dude, you know, just – there ain't a single pine tree he's never seen on this place. Yeah, uh, and and so you he helped you get your buck out, which is a real just hellacious yeah, drag. Yeah, so, so that so that was a cool hunt. So that hunt, uh, you and me had split up. You were on one side. I was hunting one clear cut. You were kind of hunting another. Th- I was hunting the hub. A hub. We'll put it that way. Clear cut thing. Anyway, without divulging too and, much information. Uh, anyways, so I shot that buck right at daylight, um, just a seven point, and uh, I caught seven point. Yeah. yeah. Well, I called you, and you're like, I think you were like, well, I'm going to sit until probably 10, 11 o'clock, because it was during the rut, and uh, and then afterwards, you know, we'll figure out, you know, need help getting it out. Well, I called my brother, Christopher, and I was like, hey, dude, can you come out and help me get this deer out? He's like, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, you shot that thing, like, right at, you shot him at gray light. Yeah. Like, like it wasn't even good light yet. I mean, it was legal. Light. Yeah, it was legal light, but it was like, I mean, yeah, You had to use your early... headlamp to see him when you shot. <laughs> <laughs> Not really, not really. No, not at all. <laughs> Please don't investigate. No, but uh, no, he was but he was locked down with a doe in that pine thicket in that clear cut. And I was able to look down top of him. And that it, that episode, man, I wish. I, I there's no way we could find that episode quickly. I don't think. Uh, were we were we talk specifically about that that hunt? Because that's the same hunt you gave yourself the COVID test with the goldenrod. Oh yeah. Oh, <sighs> that was bad. Uh, yeah, I've never had a nose. Because essentially, what happened is like. We both slipped out right at gray light. We were getting in kind of late, because uh, I think I don't know if we, I don't know if we just got out late because we're lazy, or if we were like trying to go out uh, and walk in in gray light to pick our tree or pick our spot. Because I don't think you had hunted that that cutover before, mm-hmm. had you? Because we had just found out about that cutover and like started messing with yeah, it. Yeah, it was the first like, time I've ever been there. Yeah, I had walked in there the year before and scouted it, and I was like, yeah, this looks good. Because it goes down, and there's like a bench in the cutover, and you can get on a hill and look down at that bench. And this kind of goes into a little bit of what we talked about with Jonathan was things changed so much. The year before, when I first found that spot, mm-hmm. I hunted it one time, and it was it was like a just 
a, a clear cut. There was like some sage grass in it and stuff, but nothing crazy. And then I hadn't gone back in there and we had talked about it. And I was like, yeah, you should go check this out. You liked the way it looked on the map. And so you got up in there during daylight. And that year that you, so it was the year after I found it, it was like, there was pines growing in it, but it was a lot of that sage grass and mm -hmm. sagebrush and stuff, and it was really, really tall and thick. But you were just high enough up on the hill that you could see down in it, and when you got to your spot, you looked down there, you know, at gray light, and what did you see, like a main beam or something? No, no, I saw a, a flash of white, and the first thing I saw was the doe. I uh, saw her tail kind of, you know, she was kind of doing a little hot doe, little yeah. dance. Had her tail up, and she was just kind of like, you know, doing this right here for all the YouTube How videos. How you boys doing? And, um... Once I saw her, I was like, okay, cool. Because what I had done when I got in there, I was able to get on like a kind of like a slash pile, like a big top, whatever, and like look down over into this cut. Explain what a slash pile is. Um, so when logging companies come in and they, uh, you know, cut all the trees down, they, they leave like all the branches, you know, off these pine trees. So <laughs> they'll they'll cut. And I guess that's kind of what slash is, that and all the other trash, mm -hmm. like small saplings that are in a, in a cut. And like they, just, pile they just pile it up. And some places they'll burn them. Other places they just let them rot, and you know sometimes they'll spread. I've never found anywhere where they burn them. Uh, I don't think. I mean, some I guess some people do, but I don't. I very rarely see that. Yeah, well, a lot of times they just rot down, but they'll pile them up, uh, or also they'll use them to like I guess kind of mitigate erosion, like on the logging decks and like the yeah. the logging trails, the skitter trails going through the cut. So they'll like pile it up and like just drag all that stuff down this exposed clay so it doesn't erode out. Um, so that's why a lot of times in a, in a newer clear cut, it's kind of hard to walk down logger paths like skitter trails because there's a bunch of slash laying all over the way, all over the place. And it could be, I mean, it could be branches as big around as like six, eight inches in diameter, or they could be like real small stuff. And it's, this is a tangled mess. But anyways, I found a pile of that, that I could get up kind of up on it and look down to the cut and, uh, saw a flash of white right at daylight, right at gray light. And, uh, I think I forgot my binos that day. I'm almost certain I did. Um, because I was like looking at it through the scope, and like, okay, well, there, there's a doe. And all of a sudden, I just catch that main beam kind of in around the broom sedge. Have you already stuck yourself in the face at yep. this point? Oh, you want me to tell that part too? Yeah, that's hilarious. Uh, so that's my favorite part of the story. So as I was walking in and, and got to his logging deck, this is in the midst of COVID too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is. Oh yeah, so that was yeah. Yeah, it's 2020. Okay, so um, I got to his logging deck, and I knew his logging deck was kind of high in elevation already. So I was like, man, if I could find something around it, I could like sit down because I, I think. I, I might have brought my saddle stuff in, but I wasn't planning on getting any trees because I didn't know if any of the trees were quite big enough. Yeah. Um, but uh, as I was going down to the slash pile, there was like a little drop off the logging deck, and I just tripped and fell. I mean, in the dark. You know, I had my headlamp on, but pretty much, you know, right before gray light and fell in goldenrod, which is a uh, highly uh, uh, sought-after species for deer to browse on. Um, really good nutrition. Well, in the wintertime, in the summertime, you know, it just, it's like a tall, stemmy plant. That's, you, can, you, know, you can snap yeah, it. Yeah, it's like real flexible. <laughs> well, in the winter, they dry out, and it's like a rod, golden rod, okay? <laughs> it's it it's like, like a hollow tube of, like, you know, pretty fibrous material. And I went face-planted uh, <laughs> on the back side of the slash pile. And one of those golden rods, it went, <laughs> it could not have got my nose, my right nostril any better. It went up, <laughs> and I could feel it up here between my eyes, like in my sinus cavity. And the problem was when I did it. There's probably a piece of it still in there. Yeah. Well, when I did it, I'm kind of surprised I didn't get uh, like a uh, sinus infection afterwards. But when it happened, uh. I go to like stand back up and the goldenrod breaks off and I have a stem of it. It's probably nine inches long, still hanging out of my nose. Uh. And when I go to grab onto it, there was, this is what you don't want. There was resistance. <laughs> So I go to pull on it, and there's resistance. I'm like, I just gotta, I gotta rip this thing out, and I rip it out, and it's like pulling the cork oh. out the bottom of the ocean. It oh. was just blood. Oh. I, I just the second I rip it out, and again I can feel it way like again, <laughs> like around like your eyebrow, like, up in your sinus, sinus cavity. I could feel it, and I ripped it out. God. And I should have looked. There's like brain material on it, <laughs> matter, meat, and stuff on that on that golden rod. But I ripped it out. It was like pull, you took, a, took a core sample of your brain. Yeah, and dude, I, when I ripped it out, it was again like pulling the cork out of the bottom of the ocean. It was just blood. I'm talking about racing down my face, <laughs> out my nose. Worst nosebleed, worst nosebleed I've ever had in my entire life. And it was just like I, at the time, I just had a goatee, and it was just like all in here, like down my shirt. And I finally stopped it. Like I had blood. It looked like I'd already shot a deer because I just had blood everywhere. 
And like, I was like walking, I was like sitting there on that slash pile, just like this for the YouTube listeners, with my hand in my sleeve over that nostril. Oh, and man. finally, at some point, it stopped bleeding. But uh, I didn't know how much blood I could taste blood. Like, there's blood on my mouth, and like, my it's blood's everywhere. And this comes into the story a little bit later on with Jonathan. Um, so that I see, you know, as I finally see the buck, I see his main beam. He's in such thick stuff. All you can see, like, his G2, his G3, and then, you know, his end of his main beam. It's just sage grass. Yeah, just sage grass and pines and stuff, like small pine saplings. The pines are about, at that point, they were about. Waist as, high? Yeah, they were almost as tall as the sage yeah, grass. Yeah, the sage grass is a little bit taller than that. And uh, I'm like, crap, I'm like, I'm like, it's a good buck. And I'm like, I can't shoot him right here because I can't even see. I can't even see really his head. I can see his antlers. And uh, finally, I watched him for like 10, 15 minutes. And finally, she kind of steps out through some open stuff. Slightly more open, and then he steps out right there, and I squeeze the trigger off, and boom, he turned, took off running. And one thing I've always done, and people talked about this on our YouTube channel, like with our SOA hunt last year where we shot a lot, I don't know, 10, 10 rounds at deer. Um, Andrew didn't connect with quite a few of them. Was it? It wasn't 10. I think it was eight. <clears throat> yeah, it was eight. Four, six, yeah, eight. Okay. Um, but, anyways, so. My not our best shooting. Yeah, but my no, well, hold on. not sure. Not my best shooting. I should listen. Not yeah, my best shooting. Don't, All right, move on. Move okay. on. Move on. Um, <laughs> but if the deer's still running, if I got an open shot at it, I'm going to take a follow up shot if I can. So I took a follow up yeah. shot. Did not even come close to hitting the freaking deer because uh, he was booking as fast as he could at about 160 yards. Uh, but anyways, he kind of runs and I, I kind of lose him in some sage grass and he just kind of like goes down. Uh, so I'm like, all right, cool. And I'm like, I'm pretty sure he's down like right down there, and you know, takes everybody the whole nine yards. Um, decided finally, like, it's probably like nine o'clock in the morning. I'm like, I'm gonna go look for it because Tom Chris said he couldn't get out there till like it was probably 10 o'clock. And I'm, like, I'm just gonna go look for blood. I, I told him, I'm like, hey, bring the game cart and uh, and also wear appropriate clothing. So I'm not gonna lie, it was a Sunday. I missed church that morning. He went to church, <laughs> he went to church like eight o'clock. Well, he comes out there, I think, in jeans, tennis shoes, and a polo shirt. Oh. In a hell hole. I can just picture like a, a blue, like I'm talking like neon blue shirt too. I mean, he didn't need blaze orange. You could see him from a mile <laughs> away. Okay. And uh, anyways, I go down there find blood, and it was just a nasty blood trail the whole way, and found the deer. And uh, when I find the deer, finally he gets there, and he's, I'm like, I drop him pin on Onyx. I'm like, meet me over here, and he's carrying this freaking because uh, like there's one thing about fresh clear cuts. There's slash piles everywhere, but there's also like a lot of down trees that they just didn't pick up. A lot of times they're smaller trees, like trees that weren't, you know, loggable size, as in something that they're going to throw in the truck, but they just kind of cut them down while they're clearing everything. Mm -hmm. So there's deadfall everywhere in this clear cut. And he's like hopping over crap and he's got to come, I mean, a, almost, maybe not half a mile, but uh, just under probably maybe half a mile from the truck. And for the last 300 yards, you're walking through this cut. He finally gets over there. And when he when he's walking up, he's coming over the ridge to me in the cut in the cut. And I see there's another guy with him, a, like a bigger dude. I'm like, who is that? And they come all the way down. And Chris's like, hey man, just met this guy. He said he could help us get the deer out. And he introduces himself. He's like, oh my name, my name. they call me Johnny Boy. And I'm like, all right, cool. So that's how I met Jonathan. He was over there in that general area, saw Chris and talked to Chris. He's like, yeah, I hope y'all get the deer out. Yep. Come to find out, he was also hunting that cut a little bit as well with his son. And I think they might have killed a pretty good deer back in there as well. But um, that was the one time I've gone through dragging a deer or carting a deer out that it sh we should have just cut them up. Now, I mentioned this on the podcast. We should have just cut them up right there and packed them out mm -hmm. because it was hellacious trying to cart him over all this deadfall going through this clear cut. Because everything in this clear cut's chest high probably. Yeah. You know, just grass and, you know, saplings. You know, pond saplings are like waist high. But you can't see where your feet are at. And you're just walking over all these down these down trees and branches and everything. It was it was terrible. Um, and then that hill that you got to climb up to get out of there. That hill's no joke. No, it's super crazy steep. And we had to cart him up that hill. And I mean, that alone probably took 45 minutes to try to get up that that embankment uh, that yeah. hill. So you know, it was just it that was that was rough. But uh, it was kind of funny. So we're back at the truck taking some photos, and, and uh, Jonathan's taking some photos for me. And we're sitting there, and I was like, Yeah, Andrew's just like. You know, he's just right over here, you know, kind of, you know, not terribly far. Could you hear us talking? No. Okay. Well, actually, maybe. I think I think you might text us and be like, hey, guys, like, I, th I think I can hear you. Yeah, talking. actually, yeah. That, yeah, I could hear y'all. And uh, I was like, all right, well, we got we to gotta whisper a little bit. We got to talk. And also, we're just sitting there back of the truck. And it's like noon. It's like 1 o'clock or something like that because you're sitting almost probably all well, day. Well, because not at – so this is like at noon. 
<clears throat> y'all were out, and Zach had just called me, mm-hmm. and it, it, Zach called me at like nine thirty. He's like, I just, I just killed a monster. I just killed the biggest buck of my life. <laughs> and then he killed a 165 yeah, out there. 165 inch deer. And so, and so now I'm sitting there and I'm like, any legal buck that comes by is getting smoked so we can triple. You know, because you killed one, Zach killed one. I'm like, I'm going to, I'm going to kill a buck. And I, I hadn't seen a deer yet that morning. And then, yeah. Is, I, that the, I, is that the same year you shot that big six point? This deer right here? Yeah. Yes. So I shot. Grab him real quick. I shot this deer. All the um, YouTube people can watch this. Oh, my gosh. That's why you got you to watch the podcast on YouTube, guys. I shot this deer in the same spot that I hunted that morning, but like two weeks earlier. So just, we had a, a video of a buck in there that, I mean, for real, looks like he's freaking 22 inches wide, like super wide. And which this, is not this deer. Not this deer. This deer came out, and he, which I just shot this deer anyways, but he came out and he was like, you know, facing away from me like that. You know, they always look bigger when they're facing away. And I just saw how wide he was. I was like, oh, my God, that's him. <laughs> and so, uh, uh, I got a, I got up and shot him, but it's, again different hunt. But that that was the very first time I'd hunted that spot. Mm-hmm. This was the second time I'd ever hunted that spot, mm-hmm. and yeah, it was like noon, and I just I hear something behind me well, coming up the hub, and sh- sh- and I just instantly knew it was a buck, dude. And I I'd freaking turn, and there he came walking past me at twenty yards. And I was in the saddle, and I just, I mean just raised up and shot him. Like I looked at him through the scope, and I just saw like br- big like branch mm-hmm. antler. Good brow time. I was like, oh, yeah. And that deer's in the carport, that Euro. Yeah. But anyways, <clears throat> so we're sitting there, me, Jonathan, and uh, Christopher. I think Christopher might have left by this point. And uh, we just sit there talking. All of a sudden, we hear, K-toom! and I mean, it was close. Like, <laughs> close. I mean, not like we're in danger or anything of Andrew shooting, but like a few hundred yards. There's three, a, three absolutely hundreds. no doubt who it was. Yeah. And he shoots. I look over at Jonathan. I'm like. Andrew just shot one, and you could tell he hit it because it was like, Ka-toom! yeah, yeah. You could hear the the impact, and uh, I call you like instantly, like you're just like shaking, like I just shot a buck. And I'm like, hell yeah, like we just freaking tripled up on public, man. This is crazy. And then, and then Jonathan helps me go over there and get your deer out, and come to find out he was telling us because like you went in some way, and he's like, dude, I got a trail that cuts right through this little thicket. Yeah, because I parked go- I parked next to you, uh, and I walked in that way. A long way. Oh, you would. Oh, yeah, you did. Because I came all the way up that drainage. Yeah, and uh, so he's like, he's like, man, we drive around. He's like, I got, I got. He's like, I got a little lane, you know, a little trim uh, kind of path that goes through there. Like we can get in pretty easy. I'm like, all right, cool. So we went that way, and uh, and it was got you helped you get the buck out and everything. And I'm like, dude, this is cool. Yeah, y'all showed up. I'm like, okay, who's this guy? Yeah, who's this guy? (laughs) Oh, this is John. This is Johnny boy. Just showed up. That's uh, yeah. He's he's a solid dude, man. Just showed up out of nowhere and helped me drag a deer. Never met me before. Yep. Yeah, and so uh, that, that was that was that was nice. But yeah, I appreciate. That, but that was the introduction to uh, Jonathan, or as known as Johnny Boy. So, yeah, yeah, man. Uh, that was a that was a fun. Kylie, that was a fun couple weeks. That was I think that might have been the first deer I shot with those ELDX bullets from Hornady. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's the one where, dude, I shot that <laughs> I shot that buck, and there's like this big pine tree eleven yards behind him, and it had pieces of lung stuck. To like it. just like it looked like like in the bark. Yeah, it, it was embedded. It was insane. Man, that blood trail was crazy. That's when I was like, yeah, I like these bullets because I was shooting a. Uh, ooh, what was I shooting? Um, I don't remember what I actually. I think I went straight to those when I went to the seven millimeter away. But before when I was shooting a seven mag, I was shooting a uh, nozzler partitions, mm-hmm. and uh, really good bullet. But I had issues with them at close range. And so that I was wanting to switch because I kept for some reason I'm rifle hunting and I keep shooting deer at like eight yards. Yeah. Because like you know I don't know just hunting thick stuff. I'm trying to hunt thick stuff where I can see really far, but you know you have one come out at like ten yards sometimes, and that kept happening, dude. So I switched to those. But anyways, that's a tangent. But yeah, that was the first time that uh, that we met him, and it's always fun for us to interview guys like him or guys like Scott uh, or guys like Mr. Benny who. <clears throat> have kind of grown up hunting the same areas as us. They have mm-hmm. history in the same areas. And so we can just like relate to them on mm-hmm. a, on a deeper level than a lot of our other guests. And, uh, it's always entertaining to kind of hear them talk about their experiences on these places and, and how they do things a little differently mm-hmm. than us. And I, it's fun for me cause I'm just sitting there listening and I'm like, Oh, that's why I, I didn't see anything for like three years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it, it was a, it was a really fun episode. Did, what was your, uh, what were some of your bigger takeaways? Cause I, I got a couple. Um, so uh, a couple or one that I thought was how much, first off, how much scouting he does, um, like just boots on the ground throughout the whole season, even though he's been on this place for over 20 years. 25 years um just how much time he spends out there yep and it's not like 
you find a spot and you just always go back and hunt the same like these same few spots. It's like you're always trying to like fine tune everything. Yeah. But also the idea of him hunting specific bucks on a place that like I mean gets pounded tons of pressure, tons of pressure, yes. and um, like his thought process of like hunting specific bucks and like the confidence he has like after he builds a little bit of history. He, I think he said on a podcast episode. Typically, by the time he finds a buck to the time he potentially kills the deer, it's like two years. Yeah. So, if I'm one season, maybe get him, get a chance at him the next season or it might be even the following season. Um, and uh, and just how meticulous he is on finding specific deer that he wants to go and kill. And, and see his wall, and it makes sense. Like, yeah. And also, I can see how it would give you so much more confidence when hunting a specific area. Like, maybe – the buck is in an area that you don't see just an absolute ton of sign, but mm-hmm. you know, he's there based off trail cameras, based off observations, stuff like that. And like, he just killed a couple of days before we did the podcast. He killed a really big seven point, like a huge seven point. <clears throat> yeah. And as a deer he had some history with, and funny enough, uh, he, I think he might've mentioned this on the podcast, but, um, his buddy, he went to go check one of his buddy stands. Cause he's got some private land close to some of the public. And he just went to go check a spot while he's running cameras and happened to come across that buck after he was uh, sparring with another buck. And um, he's like, I didn't want to kill him there because it was like next to one of my buddy's corn piles, which is legal for him to have on that private. Um, but he's like, I just, he's got, I got nothing against it. He's just, I don't want to kill a deer like that in a buddy's spot. Yeah. And then up for the rest of eternity, I just hear like, oh man, you killed that buck out of my spot. Oh man, you killed him <laughs> off my corn pile. I'll put that much effort into it. Oh, and he, yeah. he was able to kill the deer, you know, a couple of weeks later you know, hunting his way and fine tuning, like where that buck was spending a lot of time and actually killed him on public land. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that, I thought that was, that was pretty cool. And again, kind of shows like the character of him that, you know, it's not just every opportunity, but it's like, you know, he wants to do it on his terms, Yeah. you know, in and around where that buck feels the safest and, you know, not try to cut corners. Yeah. I was really interested to hear about his confidence with his trail cameras where mm-hmm. he's like, he's, he was saying I should be getting that deer on camera like every one to three days. I'm like, dude, let me go have out. We, have we ever had that happen? No, absolutely not. <laughs> I'm like, let, let me go out with you sometime and and just, like, see what you're doing. Like, where yeah. are you putting these cameras? Yeah. That is that is extremely impressive. Uh-huh. Uh, the, only, the best luck I've ever had with cameras is on community scrapes, and that's by far the most consistent I get. And, like, when they're hot, they're hot. When they're not, they're not, you know. Uh, we actually had that with the – with our, our cell cameras right now, that, like they were just really hot for like five days. Yeah. And I mean, just every day there's bucks daylighting on it. And now the, it's been dead for about a week. <clears throat> and this morning, one of our uh, target bucks just kind of showed up in daylight. So I don't know, maybe they're going to start doing it again. Like they kind of, it seems like they kind of cycle through. Oh, we got a doe working a scrape this morning too. Yeah, we got a doe working a scrape. So it uh, it's about to go crazy. God, dude, that deer. Yeah, big so, old thing. Gigantic six point. It's not quite as big as to John. So Jonathan, if y'all watch the YouTube video, you can kind of see it in the background. But also on the social media, we posted these photos. He's killed two of the biggest six points I've ever seen. Like gigantic six points. Um, and uh, we've we've got one on camera. He ain't he ain't that. I mean, he's bit. He's he he looks very similar to the wider one of uh yeah that Jonathan's got yeah. Um, he looks very similar to that deer. You get the um, you get the video of that deer. Of course you do. Why do I even ask? Yeah, I get I get every video. You pay you paying that five dollars every fifty. No, bro, we got the extra package. We get unlimited videos. Oh, dude? Yeah, we don't even have to pay for them anymore. So, anyways, yeah, he's a he's a great he's a great deer. Um, <clears throat> I actually went and put some more cameras out uh, this morning. So, are you watching that video? Heck yeah! I'm yeah, look at when he looks away. God, oh, good grief! <sighs> Hold on a second. Sorry mm. for the YouTube listeners or viewers. Oh, I'm going to zoom in on this deer. Oh, man. I could try to put this in the YouTube video, but it's going to be very poor quality. Goodness gracious alive. Look at that thing. All right. I'm going to put a note to uh, put that in the YouTube video. A wide load. <sighs> yeah, that's a good deer. No, I'll pass him. No, you wouldn't. You're so <laughs> full of crap. Um, uh, that's awesome. Yeah. So, like, but, uh, but again, it's just... To me, like Jonathan's perspective of like trying to find the target specific bucks, I, I always find really interesting. I'm always interested in that when guys on public, especially high pressure public, like can build enough of a pattern with a specific deer to go in there and actually kill that deer. Yeah. Um, and I just, I just, I, you know, it's just super, super interesting when you find people like that, that again, have that success that can put the pieces together and go in there and capitalize with a situation like that. Uh, cause again, 
even on pri- like private, you, you private you can't unless you, so you're a private farm or something private property. And, like you're inviting people over, maybe you can ha- kind of have some control of where people go because you can tell them like, hey, you can go here, 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 or there, uh, stay out of these areas, something like that. Yeah. If you're on a hunting club, you don't really can't really do that. Like everybody's just gonna hunt wherever they're at, but they're probably gonna be on food plots. And he talked about that with his hunting club um, or the lease that they've got. But on public. You don't know when somebody's out there. You don't know how somebody's hunting. It's literally mm-hmm. just like you, the deer, and you don't know what the outlying factors are of like hunting pressure. Yeah. So to me, that makes it even more complicated when it comes to like patterning a specific buck. Because I mean, you could have squirrel hunters come through, maybe mess them up. Um, you know, you could have somebody kind of push through a bedding area thicket or hunt around it with the wrong wind and potentially mess that deer up. But yep. for him to have the consistency, like every one to three days, he's getting that buck on camera. Very uh, impressive. I'm like, God, dude. <laughs> that is very, very, very impressive. We're talking about fine tuning, which. I mean, let me ask you something, Andrew. <clears throat> mm-hmm. We've looked at all these GPS studies of so these bucks using all these different focal areas. Okay. Yep. If you're getting a buck on camera every day or every other day, he's pretty honed in on one spot. You, yeah, you're all over that deer. But that's what I'm saying. But like off all the GPS studies we've seen, yeah, you know they're kind of you know bouncing around a good bit. They don't have like that one spot they're really focused on. So mm-hmm. explain that for me. Well, <clears throat> it could be that. Like, if you look at the MSU thing that we were looking mm-hmm. at uh, earlier, like two weeks ago or three weeks ago, uh, the particular buck that they used in that example had, like, eight different focal areas. Mm-hmm. But if you notice, there was a cluster of focal areas that were all kind of, like, right there around each other. Mm-hmm. So they were kind of on a field edge. Uh, there's, like, a big ag field right there, and then there's, like, an island of, of timber out in the field. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's two of those that he used as a focal area. But then on the actual edge of the field and the timber – there was like two or three right there too, and they they couldn't be more than a couple hundred yards from each other. They were all in a pretty tight area, and I'm assuming there's probably some kind of little thicket right there on that field edge that he was liking. Mm-hmm. So I, I'd be assume, I'd I'd bet that it was a situation like that, and with the GPS uh, studies that like we did with mm-hmm. with that Auburn data. I actually went to our Patreon and reposted it the other day, and I watched a little bit of it for the first time. And first of all, I've come a long way with the studio. Good grief. <laughs> like, man, who is bad? Yeah. Uh, but but looking at that data, it's, it's kind of the same thing. So, like, there's this one buck in particular that he was, he's kind of interesting little case study because he went to the same hardwood bottom like 27 nights in a row. Yeah. Not the same spot, but the same three 400-yard stretch mm-hmm. of hardwoods. And up above these hardwoods, very, very typical of the southeast, hardwood drainage next to the creek, up on the hill, there's thin pines. And this buck would go up into the thin pines in the daytime, and he'd move around in there during the day, mm-hmm. and then he'd go down into the into the area, into the hardwood drainage at night. And he did that 27 nights in a row. And he never really, I mean, there was times where I guess he probably bedded in like the same spot, but for the most part, he was kind of all over the place in that little pine thicket. Like sometimes he'd jump across the road, sometimes he'd be up at the head of a drainage, Mm -hmm. sometimes he'd be on the side of a ridge, but he was in a pretty small area, but, uh, and several of them are like that too. Um, There were some that were hanging out around, uh, for instance, uh, like a six, seven year old pine plantation super thick underneath, mm-hmm. uh, kind of like what we talked about with Jacob Lyshen, mm-hmm. super thick underneath, like probably some of the most secure cover that a deer has down here. Uh, it'd be like that, and then there'd be some planted pines next to it that had been thinned that mm-hmm. had a really thick understory, and then there'd be, you know, a different age pine, like kind of all three around each other, and I'd, I'd see bucks on that GPS data kind of bouncing around from those, like they'll bed up in this drainage, and they'll bed off the side of the road, and then they'll bed over here. But... All those quote unquote focal areas are, I mean, they're 100, 200, 300 yards apart from each other. Mm -hmm. So you're kind of all over that deer, you know, like he's bouncing from those little focal areas, but he's still in a tight area. He's just kind of pinballing around in Mm -hmm. that tight area, which I think kind of, I think what, what Jonathan found like kind of supports that, honestly, because I think that when you're, when you're on a deer, you know, and you're like where he really wants to be specifically talking in this pine country, then I, I think it is possible to get them on camera that much, but I just haven't been able to do it yet. But also, <clears throat> that's probably because of how I place my cameras, to be honest with you, because I rarely put a camera on like just on a trail, yeah, you know, or, or a path of travel, like very rarely. I'll put a camera on like a creek crossing or a, a scrape or something, but 
I pretty much never put them on trails, and I changed that. I went and put four cameras on trails today, so we'll see how that does. But I think that I think that might be why he he's seeing that. Because um, like I said, dude, w- when we go back to again that MSU buck bedding study, mm-hmm. a buck's home range seems like, or a deer in general, is pretty tied to hunting pressure and resources. And so out here, with the amount of hunting pressure there is, and the amount of resources those deer have. Cause they can they can eat anywhere, you know. Like this place, this whole place is a freaking pine plantation or a cutover, you know. There's not a lot of diversity from that, so he can go like if if that buck walks 300 yards, he's in a different aged pine stand. Basically, he walks out of this pine thicket into another pine thicket that's a little bit different. So like he's kind of and there's creeks everywhere. They all run with water, especially in the winter time. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't feel like and there's plenty of does. And there's high hunting pressure. So it doesn't if, – if he was the kind of buck that had to go and walk seven miles between everything, I think he'd be dead already. You know what I'm saying? By the way, I was doing a little Onyx e-scouting Uh-oh. on some public. I found a spot. I was drooling over. This is like last night. I was just looking at some stuff. <clears throat> and uh, found a clear cut, uh, probably a couple years old. And uh, it's got a pond in it. Mm. Thick buffer all the way around it. And it also – Thick drainages coming off both sides of the pond through the cut. Okay. I'm like, if there's a big buck. Okay. I feel like that's where one would hold up. Yeah, drop me a pin. Man. Oh, dude. It <laughs> looked incredible. Looked incredible. And I'm like, you know, it's kind of cool because I'll do that a lot. Like, get on Onyx and start looking at just random pieces of public that maybe, like, maybe some we've hunted, some we haven't, and just kind of looked, and especially with the, uh, the new um, recent aerial imagery where you can see, like, those fresh cuts and stuff. Um, doing that in some different places and it's like it's crazy what will pop up and i'm like oh my god dude i'm like yeah. okay that looks that'll be good in a few years yeah for sure um what what's your take on that by the way on what the, the, the buck bedding and everything yeah and like yeah. Getting, i mean i think that's we, i guess we didn't get in that much detail on exactly how like what he puts a lot of his cameras on but a lot of i know i pried a little bit and, and i didn't get what i wanted we're gonna have to get him back on yeah. i'm gonna grill him on that <laughs> <laughs> i'm really curious but like um it's got to be like travel corridors of some sort in between thicker bedding. Like it's in the thick cover yeah. is if it, where I assume he's putting a lot of cameras. Um, just like Scott Seals, um, you know, every time Scott Seals sends us like a video of a buck or a photo of a buck, it's always like in, in a pine thicket. In a pine thicket every time. Yeah. And I'm like, you know, there's something there, and that's what it'd be. I'd be very interested in picking some of those guys' brains on like camera placement, like. What do you need to see on that specific trail that would tell you, like, this is worth putting a camera here? Yeah. You know, is it tracks? Is it um, droppings somewhere around the trail? Is it, are you finding rubs on the trail? Are you finding scrapes around the trail? Like, what are some of those outlying factors? Or is it just a gut feeling, like, I'm going to put a camera here and see what shows up? Mm-hmm. Um, because, yeah, that's like a common thing I've seen with, you know, it sounds like what Jonathan's doing, but also like what Scott does and some of these other guys. I think um, Baxley, too. Yeah. Every, yeah. Every time Baxley, uh, like, Actually sent us a couple of photos before he showed me some photos. I'm like, that sucks. That camera's in the thick. I mean, that is like thick, thick. Which I mean, some a lot of, some of our cameras are, but it's always associated around like some kind of scraping activity for the most part. Yeah. But it's like from what it looks like on, like say like Baxter for example, it's just like a trail kind of cutting through, or something like that. Yeah. So when I went out to, I went out this morning uh, just on a. Me and Mike were talking about the hunting club, and you know we got that that big 10 point we've been chasing out there. We actually talked recently about how I was a little discouraged because like that, that big 10 was out there, but we had a lot more nice bucks on public land. Nothing quite as big as him on, on camera so far, but uh, a lot of bucks almost as good as him Mm -hmm. on camera. And um, I went and pulled some, some cards at the club that have been out. One of them being on a pine in in a pine thicket on a trail, just Mm -hmm. on a trail, one trail crossing. And uh, I'll be danged if another hit lister didn't show up. A big old nice eight Well, you point. say show up. He could have been there the whole time. You just didn't know about well, it. Well, yeah, exactly. Well, it's a new part of the property. I haven't ran cameras in. It was it was in some thicker pines. And uh, it's just kind of a spot I had a hunch about, but I hadn't actually walked into. Mm-hmm. So I finally went and, go dropped a cam- uh, went and dropped a camera there. And, uh, and yeah, dude, he showed up twice on that camera. And he showed up on another camera ooh, about a quarter mile away um, mm-hmm. at like 3 a.m. And he was he was... At, uh, he was in the pine thicket after dark too, though, which, you know, that's a, that's a whole nother conversation. Cause I, I've found that when I do put cameras in those pine thickets, I get just as many nighttime pictures as daytime pictures. If not, maybe more. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll get like actually right where 
Jonathan helped us drag mm-hmm. those deer out. I had a camera in there, and I had I had a big eleven point, like big old, just nice buck. And he came through there a bunch of times, and it was always at like two o'clock in the morning. Looks very similar to this deer. Yeah. He's bigger than this deer. He had an extra point on there, so. Uh, but yeah, it looked very similar to that deer. And he and he came through a whole bunch of times at like three o'clock in the mm-hmm. morning. And then when the rut started, he came through a couple times in daylight. So that, that's at like eight a.m. That's what I'm looking for. All yeah. the people out there. I'd pass that deer. <laughs> That's got turkey spur on the back of his. Oh yeah, that's my favorite part. Back of his bean. What a cool deer, man. Yeah. So, yeah, that 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 was confusing. But anyways, so got that deer. Got another six point, like just big old six on camera. Uh, so went and scouted some more today and put out four more cameras. And these are these are more cameras, uh, not that I'm trying to hunt off of per mm-hmm. se, but these are cameras to basically leave and let them soak. Well, actually, two of them are. Two of them. So, so the way I did it is I went and just busted through this pine thicket mm-hmm. that I know these deer are hanging out in because we've had a couple hunts out there uh, that have been unproductive over the last month or so. Uh, we started really hot. Mike missed the big 10 point with his bow. I killed the big six point that was running with the big 10 point. And then we had a few more encounters after that, but it's kind of dried up since then. And so I told Mike, I'm like, hey, you know, this Saturday, this Friday and Saturday, Let's just let's just forego the hunt. Like, take the gun with you, uh, but don't don't bring a tree stand and just give up your day and just go scout. You know, like go out and just let's refine these deer rather than beat our head against the wall and and continue to hunt these same spots over and over again. Let's just start from a clean slate, and just go walk the place. Mm-hmm. So that's what I did this morning, and I I went and just busted through this pine thicket that I know these deer have been hanging out in. And uh, once you get into the pine thicket, it's it's really hard to get into because the edge is so thick. But once you get into it, there's open patches, and you kind of follow like the the thread of the the open patches, which is still kind of thick going through. But there's parts of it that are like absolutely impenetrable. I mean, it's crazy. And going through there, it didn't take long. I found a really nice deer trail coming through one of those openings, so I went ahead and put a camera on that. Followed it out. Uh, went and hit a couple food plots and checked those food plots, and and they were getting hammered. And there was sign coming and going from the food plot. So the first one didn't have any buck sign on it or anything at all. Mm. Just a lot of tracks. The second one, I looped up through the woods to, popped out on the back side of it, and it is tore up with sign. I mean, tore up. They have, I mean, to the point where I thought there was like corn or something out there, but I couldn't find any, and uh, which we're not allowed to bait on this particular lease. And uh, on the back side of that food plot was two scrapes that I found in the past. And, dude, it was freaking tore up. Those two scrapes were like, the licking branch on one of them was about the size of my pinky, and it was snapped off, like, fresh. And the ground was, like, super tore up underneath them, too, where you can tell multiple deer have come and pawed these out. And so I basically took the trail that it looked like that buck sign was coming out of, and I followed it, and I just started walking through this, like, kind of sapling thicket thing over there. Uh, found several good rubs in it. Ended up finding another scrape on the back side of that thicket. And uh, Any beech trees in that thicket? No, no beech trees. So, like, completely leafless in there. Yeah, it's pretty leaf. You can see, like, if you sat on the ground, you could shoot probably 40 yards or so. Uh, and, you know, this club, like I said, is not known for buck sign so far. Uh, like, I just I don't find a lot of rubs. I don't find scrapes. I have, I'm yet to find a community scrape that, that I'd feel confident putting a camera on. And that's really what I was looking for today. Like, I, I've been looking at the maps, like, kind of studying the terrain, like, trying to figure out where one would be, because I've already checked the traditional spots where one should be, and I haven't found one. And, uh, I, yeah, I went in there looking for one, still didn't find one, found a, a scrape, you know, maybe, I mean, a quarter the size of this table mm-hmm. uh, on a nice trail crossing, and I went ahead and put a camera on it. And the reason I did is because of what Jonathan was talking about. He said that a lot of times those biggest bucks – you're they're not coming to the community scrape um they might swing around it or whatever but a lot of times where he's getting them on camera uh, is on those little one-off scrapes Mm -hmm. you know and it was kind of interesting because a lot of times you know you'll find those little one-off scrapes and they'll be just like you know pawed out but there'll be stuff in it it's kind of sloppy it looks like you just took your foot and you know kicked the ground out and it doesn't look you know like a clean perfect little scrape yeah this was like a perfect little scrape uh like You know, a little bit bigger than this recorder right here. Like, just perfect. And it was, like, completely free of dirt. 
it seems like it had been free worked. of dirt. I or? mean, free of free of like leaves and okay. stuff. Well, he he dug, went all he, the way to the bedrock. Yeah, he went to the bedrock. That's <laughs> what I was gonna say. So, like, dude, he's a little fired. So, up. but like the the it's like super clean looking. Like it's been worked multiple times, mm-hmm. and it was the only one in there. So I'm like, whatever, we'll see. I don't know. I don't know what it's gonna end up being, but in my mind. What I want to believe is that like there's one buck that works that scrape, and he's running the edge of that thicket, and he's swinging around that food plot because it sets up perfect for that. It sets up absolutely perfect for him to swing around that food plot. You're never going to kill him in that food plot, mm-hmm. and uh, and he's got this little scrape where these doe trails are crossing that he can monitor. Uh, so I'm really hopeful about that one. Uh, and then I went up to you know the bedding area where like we know this ten point has been living and and some of his buddies, and. Uh, I found I picked a tree to basically hunt that bedding area, and uh, I'm pr- I'm probably gonna do it. I don't know when. Um, it's gonna have to be a morning hunt mm-hmm. just because you're gonna be too. It's gonna be way too loud getting in there. The tree is like covered with vines, so I'm gonna have to cut my way up the tree. Oh man, you should have already prepped it. Well, I, pre- I should have carried that one stick with you. I did have it, but I didn't have my saddle, oh. so I prepped I prepped the bottom of the tree. But my plan is just. Like, I'm going to have to get in there really early anyways because I think they're going to be coming back before daylight. And uh, I'm just going to get in there at, like, 4 o'clock or so and, and climb up, get everything ready, and then just take a nap or something in the tree before daylight uh, because it's going to get light at probably about 6 a.m. is shooting light here. So I'm just going to get up super early and get in there and just be settled and ready to go and do that on a day where I know I can sit either all day or at least until, like, two o'clock or so uh because that's a spot where i feel like you're gonna you could totally kill them like nine ten eleven mm-hmm. noon that kind of midday time frame get them bounced around in that little thicket shaking things up but that spot looks really good and uh some of the trails coming through there again i've talked about how this club has no bucks on on it well some of the trails coming out of there have very impressive rubs on them about as tall as this table a little some of them a little bit taller than that on pretty good sized trees um, and there's a, there's so much deer crap. There is deer crap everywhere. C- big clumped up deer crap all over the place. Um, so that made me feel really good about it. And I almost put a camera on that trail, which is about 30 yards in front of the tree that I picked out. But I was like, you know what? I don't really think I need a camera on this because we've we got him on camera around this mm-hmm. like a bunch of times. Uh, I don't feel like I feel like if I put a camera here, it's it's either gonna one talk me out of hunting the spot because I'm not getting him on that camera, when in reality he could be anywhere in there, and not just on that specific trail. Uh, and two, it might scare him, because it's pretty invasive. Like, hunting this spot's going to be pretty invasive, which is why I want to be really selective about when I hunt it. Mm-hmm. So I did back off, and eventually this trail crosses, uh, this deer trail goes and crosses a road. And so I ended up putting a camera like five yards off the edge of the road watching the trail. So that is a camera I can go and just kind of check you know, on a random afternoon or whatever, when I got 30 minutes, uh, I can run out there and check that and just monitor it and just see what's going on. Uh, and I got another one or another crossing uh, further down the road. Uh, but those are really just to more monitor what bucks end up coming through um, and, and just seeing, you know, the new kids on the block um, because it's going to kind of help us decide whether or not we're going to stay in this club. Yeah. Yep. So, anyways, mm. I'm really excited about those, dude. I'm, uh, I'm actually very excited to have them on those those trails and the thickets. Uh, you never know what's going to come by. Like, that's fun. So, we'll if, see. You, if you get that new eight point showing up during daylight, is there a way you could kill them in that pine thicket? Oh yeah, oh yeah. I got I got like four trees picked out today. Um, that I I would hunt blind. I don't need the cameras to like tell me what's in there because the thing is, uh, I I know these deer exist on the property Mm -hmm. and uh, like one one thing about this property the lack of sign is a little bit of an advantage because i've learned that if you do find the sign you are ab you are on the deer 100 percent. so like i i think that i think that these bucks are holding in here and i think they're bouncing from this particular bedding area to other bedding areas off the property but as far as like what's on our property this is a hundred percent like the nucleus of deer activity uh, and and no one really hunts around it very much, so that's probably why. But the habitat's really good there. Mm-hmm. It's really the only part of the property with really good habitat, in my opinion. Yeah. So we'll see, we'll see, we'll see. Mm. But yeah, I'm, I'm pretty excited, dude. Has anyone else in the club killed anything? Someone dropped a jawbone in the box, uh, but it's it's 
pretty it's a pretty small jawbone, so I'm pretty sure it's probably off a doe or something. But I, I didn't ask what it is. But as far as I know, uh the only deer that have been killed, I killed a doe on opening day. I killed that big six, and then there's that doe, what I'm assuming is a doe in the in the jawbone box. So three deer, I killed two of them. <laughs> So I don't know. I don't know. I haven't. I haven't really asked. Uh, I haven't really ran into anybody. A um, couple of the guys in the club think that I hunted like they they planted their own little food plot down in this area, and they think that I killed that six point on their food plot. And I haven't talked to them yet, but they've been talking to other people. And through the grapevine, I think they're mad at me because they think I killed it on their food plot. So of I'm, course, I'd be mad too. I'm trying like, to. I'm trying. That boy came in here and yeah. shot one of my deer. I'm trying to run into him. One of them was at the property this morning, and I hung out for a minute, seeing if he'd come to the pinout board, but I hadn't talked. He to saw him. you were there, and he was just avoiding you at all costs. Uh, maybe I don't know. So, yeah, I, don't, I don't need that confrontation because because they talked to Sam because Sam was pinned out near one of their spots, and they're like, "Hey, did you go get in that ladder stand?" And Sam's like, "No." He's like, "Well, that's our ladder stand. Don't hunt it." And he's like, "Okay." So I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. I want to talk to him, clear things up. I don't want him to be mad at me. Nah, nah, just let it, let it sizzle. Let, let it. Yeah, man. Well, I have a reality TV show on Andrew Hunting Club. <laughs> the drama. The drama. Sit those guys in for an uh, interview by themselves and be like, all right, so, <laughs> so what's happening right here? I mean, that old boy came down here, killed one of our deer. He's like, oh, we're pissed. Mm. Slash his tires. Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> yep. I don't know, bro. Uh, Anyways, all right, let's get to some Q&As unless you got anything else. Nope, nope. Yeah, another. All right, where can uh... so yeah Q and A's? Uh, you can submit your Q and A's down in the show notes below on the podcast or on YouTube. The show description, you can. There's a link down there for Q and A's. You can submit your Q and A's, and we answer those on these Thursday episodes. So again, we've had a ton of them come in, along with listener success stories. Again, to kill a buck or kill a deer using tips and strategies that you've learned from the podcast, whether it's from me and Andrew or also from a guest on the show, you can write those in. Again, that link for the listener success story is down below in the show notes and on the show description on YouTube. Yep. All right, first up, we got Brody Cheapwood from Alabama. He said, uh, the past three years, we've had bucks on camera, but we never seem to see any while we are hunting. Am I just in the wrong place? Yes, for sure, I would say. Yeah, I mean, but also I'll say this. Uh, so last week's episode with uh, Jacob Leishan talked about you could potentially, especially if you have a small property that sets up more so just as a uh, – I think he calls it like a transitional property. Like they're not really bedding. They're not really feeding on your property. They're just kind of moving through. If yeah. you're on like, a, again, a smaller property, like less than a hundred acres, um, you could absolutely have a situation like that. Where like, for whatever reason, unless you do something different to that property, they're just kind of passing through. You might catch them at random yeah. times during the day or at night a lot. Um, now, if you're on a piece of public or you're on a larger, you know, hunting club or private land lease, whatever. Um, yeah. You're just, you're just in an area that those deer just aren't using or, Really look, you know, look internally at yourself. What are you doing? What are y'all doing that potentially could keep you guys from shooting deer? Do you use the same exit and the entrance routes every single time? So your ladder stands and lock-ons that are pre-hung up. Are you paying attention to the wind direction? Um, do you only hunt it during certain conditions, or is it every time you go you hunt your stand, no matter the conditions? Yeah. Um, there's a lot of outlying factors that could potentially keep you, especially if you're catching bucks during daylight. On, you know, on a property, on trail camera. But when you show up, they're just not there. Typically, in my experience and talking to people in the past, it's more than likely if he's using it all the time and you go in there and you don't see that deer, he somehow knows you're in there by seeing you, smelling you, or hearing you based yep. off something that you're doing. So take that consideration. And also, I would say if you're hunting a lot of pre-hung stands, get yourself, whether it's a climber, whether it's a saddle, whether it's a mobile lock-on and sticks, Use something to kind of bounce around the property and hunt your way around and try to see if you can find that hot sign. Because, again, if, if you're hunting these areas, and you don't give us a ton of information here, but if you're constantly hunting food plots or areas or bait sites if you're on private land and you're just not seeing the bucks there, go in and around there. Try to find, like what Andrew's talking about with his club, and try to find where that hot sign's at, those fresh rubs, fresh scrapes, fresh tracks, droppings, all that. And start focusing on those areas more so than your destination food sources, like your your you know bait station, uh, you know corn pile feeder or food plot. Yeah. Um, and you'll probably start seeing more deer, but also you might have a better opportunity. Probably will definitely have a better opportunity of killing a buck by doing something like that. Yeah, like if you're getting them on at, on camera at night, then maybe it's time to start backtracking them and try to figure out where they're coming from. Uh, like I don't I don't know what kind of property you have or hunting club or lease or. If you're hunting public, but yeah, I'd start moving around. I mean, if it's been three years and y'all aren't seeing any bucks, like y'all need to 
get something. You sound just like every other member in Andrews Hunting Club. Yes, actually, that's true. Because that's what they say. Oh man, there ain't no, there ain't many bucks here. They're all at out here at night. Oh, they ain't got no, ain't nobody shot a buck in four years. Blah 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 blah. Um, the bucks are there, man. They're there. You just everybody hunts in very easy to get to spots, shooting houses, ladder stands, food plots, power lines, stuff like that, and. If you're constantly hunting those same spots, those deer are getting conditioned. The does are getting conditioned to you being there. They kind of probably know the scent check around, you know, 50, 100 yards down one of you. Um, and then just, they might not even blow. They just aren't going to go to that food plot. Oh, yeah. Like when I killed that six point this year, the big six at the club, him and his little bachelor group were out in the open way before dark. But they were like, they were staged up. It was like your classic example of like a staging area kind of thing where they were kind of, they were hanging out. And they were going right to one of those food plots that I checked today. Mm -hmm. But the at the time I shot that buck, they would have not made it to that food plot. I mean, it would have been probably five minutes after legal light that mm -hmm. they made it to that food plot. And they were coming straight behind the ladder stand. Mm -hmm. So if you were in that ladder stand, they would have came from straight behind you. The wind was wrong for that ladder stand that day. So they would have smelled you before they got there. But it's like... For instance, if, if they had a camera on that thing, they're going to be getting bucks on camera, but you know, because of how the deer are accessing it and how they're accessing their stand, they like they, that's one thing about, you know, he thinks I killed it in a spot. I'm like, if I thought you were going to kill the buck right there, you probably would have already killed it, you know. Like if you if you were going to be able to kill that buck in that spot, you probably would have already killed it. Yeah. So so yeah, man, just change things up, start moving around, start doing something different, you know, and and maybe hunt the the spots on your property that you don't think are that great based on your current thinking. That That's one thing that I started doing uh, yeah. years ago. Like kind of get outside the comfort zone and, and hunt a spot that you maybe don't think is the best based on your current, you know, preconceived notions or whatever. And then, you know, might open some new horizons for you. So I'd uh, love for you to write back in and, with more details and, and, and how you end up doing this season. Yeah, and uh, an episode you ought to listen to and I think will help you tremendously, especially if you're on a hunting club or some private property. Um is episode we did with Kevin Tull. So I've mentioned this episode a couple times in the past uh, past episodes. Uh, if I can spell Tull is correctly. Um, and to me, it's one of the best episodes I think we've ever done when it comes to like hunting a hunting club or lease specifically. Um, and it's episode uh, 206, Finding and Hunting Big Buck Sanctuaries with Kevin Tullis. And that's from November of 2020. Um, so again, you can just search Kevin Tullis, his last name is spelled T U L L I S, uh, uh, search in the search bar, whether you're on Spotify or if you're on Apple podcasts and then hit my library and it'll pull up his episode from our podcast with him. So you don't have to scroll all the way back to episode 206. Um, uh, but that would be a really good episode because that's what Kevin's done. Kevin will get in clubs where maybe guys aren't having a ton of success, but there's big deer there and he's able to find how those big deer are using areas that like maybe some of the hunting club or if you were in that hunting club, it'd be like your negative terrain place that people aren't going, not necessarily where deer aren't going, but where people aren't going Yeah, and find these areas in between food plots and areas that guys just aren't hunting very much. And he's able to kill really good bucks in those areas that kind of fly under the radar of most of the other members. hundred percent. All right. This is from Kane Byers from North Carolina. Uh, hi there. I can't remember the episode, but who was hunting out of a boat and shooting deer within eyesight of the boat? Thanks. Love the content. So we never interviewed that gentleman. Um, hopefully we're going to have him on at some point. Um, his name's Scott. Um, yep. And uh, you want to give a rundown of kind of like what he does? Yeah. So Scott, Scott's an interesting guy. So I've, we've hunted with Scott a little bit in the past. Uh, he's a good buddy of Wes Moe. And um, he hunts a lot of different river systems. And he's been doing it, I mean, since like the 70s. 70s yeah. and 80s and one thing that he learned while hunting rivers is a lot of times especially if it's big hardwood bottoms a lot of your thicker cover is right on the water line right on the edge of the bank for the maybe the first 10 yards is the thickest cover and then once you get off that it's all shaded out because you know it's a lot of big oaks grown there and uh it's just a lack of cover so one thing that he's learned over you know the last three four decades is setting up pulling your boat up in an area that pinches those deer down where they, first off, they want to walk the water line anyways, because that's where the thick cover's at. 
but even pinches them down even more so because of slews and different things like that. And literally will park the boat, and he's killed multiple really big bucks where he could literally, if he wanted to, he could jump out of his stand into his boat if he wanted um, because they're walking that close to the waterline. And if you get, you know, 30 yards, 40 yards off the waterline or even 100 yards off the waterline, you might not even see those deer because they're going to be coming behind you, slipping down that bank. Yep. Um, but, yeah, Scott's never been on the podcast, but hopefully he'll come on it at some point. Yeah, yeah, that'll be a really fun episode. Um, all right, last question. This is from Nathan Nader Barber from Tennessee. Hey, guys, absolutely love the show, and I found y'all in the dead of summer when most of the whitetail junkies are looking for something to quench that thirst. Uh, y'all have y'all have improved my woodsmanship, my topo map skills, and how I analyze new ground and different tactics and feed trees, uh, and honestly learning to hunt deer where deer are and not where you want them to be. So my question is, I've got a WMA that is currently being harvested for timber. There is a pipeline cutting through several SMZs, a clear cut that is so grown up with a... St- uh, a state would wait. A state, a state, winning. a state winning beagle dog couldn't push through it to find a <laughs> rabbit. <laughs> um, tons of pines. What is y'all's opinion on hunting within a quarter mile to a couple hundred yards from where they are currently harvesting timber? Sorry to write so much, but finally on last week's episode, y'all were talking about shooting an eighty-pound bow and not being scared of the shoulder. I have a listener unsuccess story. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, listening to some of y'all's early season feed tree tactics, I was able to get on a really nice public land buck that y'all guided me to. Had a forty a forty yard quartering to me shot. I hit the shoulder, uh, two inches of penetration, swacker, broken arrow, and a blood trail that petered out after five hundred yards. So them shoulders are tough, fellers. I think I'm gonna go back to a thunderhead next year. Shoot straight, keep up the good work, Nader. <laughs> That's awesome, man. Good old Thunderhead classic. Yeah. Um, all right. So, uh, but the question, I the guess, question is about how far away you, if you would hunt, you know, around from where they're active cutting. Yes. Now I got an episode for you. What's his name again? Nader. Nate. Yep. Uh, Nate, you need to go back to all the way back to 2020. Okay. This is episode 183, and this that, again episode 183. No substitute for woodsmanship with Ben George. Yep. So Ben George, Andrew's mentor. Uh, he talks about a lot in this episode. Ben just killed a hammer. Just killed a hammer, hammer of, an of a public land buck. Dude, freaking. I mean, the a deer, huge pe- the deer every Alabama hunter for the most part dreams of. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, but he talks about in that in that podcast on some of the hunting clubs he's been in the past where they've had active logging going on. And a lot of times when act, I actually just saw this on some national forest I went and scouted uh, a little while ago. Um, when they're logging something, they typically, you know, say it's like a hundred acre area that they're going to cut. They'll start at one section and they'll kind of work their way through there. Um, so, you know, they'll have one section, maybe 20 acres done in the first, you know, day or two, a couple days. And then they're kind of working on the next section, next session. They kind of work their way through. He's talked about killing like really big bucks, especially during the rut, cruising through like some of that open stuff around the big slash piles. Well, you might have 15, 20 foot tall mounds of, of debris, uh, from them logging and these bucks shooting through all that stuff, you know, kind of working around it, going from point A to point B across one of these open cuts and actually killing big deer there. I know of a guy, uh, just based off what he posted, this is a couple years ago on some public in Alabama. He went into an area that literally they had just turned the saws off. Yes. Okay. And killed a hammer of a 13 point walking, supposedly with the story. I, we didn't interview the guys. It was on social media a few years back. The buck was walking through like an SMZ and then popped out through a low ditch that ran up through that cut. And he was sitting on a slash pile and just happened to catch that buck coming through the wide open. There's not a blade of grass on this place. It is just dirt and just broken down, you know, tree tops and and caught it slipping across there during the rut. So you can absolutely kill deer in like that. Yeah. But there has to be a reason for why they're crossing through there. I think there has to be a train feature or something like that. But also... Uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, actually, no, on this episode with with John Baxley, Baxley had mentioned he had talked to a, a logger who was cutting some public, and the logger was talking about a doe almost harassing Big him. Old nanny down every, there. every time he'd cut a tree down <laughs> and he's dragging it, the doe would be following the skitter, eating the leaves off the tree as he was pulling it. Um, and we've seen that before. I know of other guys who've talked about like while they're fresh cutting and there's all these fresh tops on the ground. Uh, and I wonder if it it, it has a depend probably on species because right now if they cut a bunch of oaks down there ain't gonna be nothing for them to eat on other than like little woody brows 
Um, but at certain points of the year, if they're cutting stuff, say like in November in Alabama, we still have the leaves on the trees a little bit. Those does will just come and just hammer on those leaves on those tops. Yeah, I've also vines and stuff growing up in them. Like if there's honeysuckle mm. growing up on the tree, especially if it's like a, a really really thick pine stand that they're cutting, there's yeah. gonna be a lot of stuff, a lot of greenery that is growing. You know, 10, 12, 20 feet high in those oh, trees, yeah. and that they're putting on the ground, and it's like a it's like a buffet yeah. for those deer. So yeah, no, they don't mind it at all. Especially, I mean, if they live in timber country, like they're probably they've probably encountered logging at some point in the past. Um, oh, they're not scared of it. I don't think yeah, no, one bit. I don't. I don't think so at all. Like, and also, I think they, they figure out pretty quick whether or not something's dangerous. Yeah, and you know? I think there's a curiosity to it too of like that open ground. And uh, again, if you're wondering, like, should you hunt around it? If the signs there, and I guarantee you, walk through one of those fresh cuts, you're gonna find tracks everywhere. Yeah, and they're gonna be eating tops. They're gonna eat vines and everything that's been laying on the ground that were on the trees. Um, so it might not be a bad idea to actually sit one of those spots and kind of do an observation spot, especially or observation sit specifically with a rifle if you could. Yep. So maybe one pops out, you can get a shot. Um, but also in and around those areas, like if you have like a low spot, we talk about this all the time. Like my favorite spot to hunt, and I think Andrew's favorite spot to hunt in a clear cut is when you have like a ditch that runs mm-hmm. up in that clear cut, then they cut across the ditch, but it's a low spot that goes up through that cut. For whatever reason, those deer because they can stay a little more hidden, they'll get down in that ditch, and that ditch might be six feet wide it might be 40 feet wide or wider than that you know real gradual ditch and they'll kind of run up that thing and it's not really an smz because they didn't leave any trees there they cut right across it um but a lot of times when you have those low spots that are crossing through a clear cut that's what i would want to be looking at if i was sitting one of those specific clear cuts like this yeah 100 percent. no i i agree uh yeah don't be afraid of the logging decks um some people i mean some people will even seek those out so I mean, I wouldn't be afraid of it at all. Yeah. And and that can also be actually a good thing, you know, when it's so, so thick like that. It's creating more diversity. And that curiosity factor, I feel like, actually is something that people overlook a little bit. Mm-hmm. Like, those deer want to know what's going on. And when all of a sudden this this super dense thicket that's been around for years and years is all of a sudden just a field, basically, mm-hmm. like daylight, uh, they're going to be really curious about that. They're going to want to go check it out. That and also, there's probably a very good chance, especially if it's you know rutting you know in and around where you're at, you could probably sit on a slash pile because people are like, well, where do I put a stand at? Because especially if it's like a uh, they cut like a ridge top, like you sit on one side, you can only see one face of that ridge. If you can get up in the clear cut and find a slash pile to sit on top of, like Baxley talked about this too, and you can sit up on that slash pile and like look out over a whole bunch more stuff. I think there's a very good chance you catch a buck, maybe not walking through that cut, but he's parallel on the edge of it, and you can kind of catch him from a distance, kind of you yeah. know working that hard edge between what's cut and what's not cut, especially if there's a creek running by there or something like that, and you probably could get a shot at him. I think I was talking to uh, Nick Harris last year. Mm-hmm. I think I think he killed a buck. He either killed a buck or, or when I was talking to him, he had like seen a deer. Or something. I, I know he told me he'd seen a bunch of does on fresh cuts. Like yeah, that. and he sent me like a picture where he was hunting, and it was like a fresh cut, um, like super super fresh, which I've never actually hunted before. Mm-hmm. I'd be interested in trying to hunt it. Yeah. You know, um, I'm kind of curious. I'm wondering if they're actually about to cut some stuff on our hunting club. So. Oh, that'd be so good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it'd be interesting. So oh. so, anyways. Uh, yeah, I get that. That's that's three, man. That's so. Awesome, sweet. Oh, well, that's three. You got to pay the fee now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. Well, uh, again, appreciate everybody's been writing in the listener uh, Q and A's. I wonder uh, how many people got that reference in the audience. They probably don't listen to Andy Frisella. Oh, probably not. Anyways, <laughs> go, go listen on. to the real AF podcast. <laughs> you get what we're talking about. Don't listen to it with your kids in the car. Yeah, don't listen to it with your kids in the car. Um, but anyways, no. Appreciate everybody who's been watching the podcast, writing in reviews, writing in uh, Q and A's, writing in listener success stories. It's been awesome. Kind of getting some feedback from you guys over the season. Again, unfortunately, if you're listening to us and you're up somewhere in the Midwest, God bless. You. God bless you. <laughs> it's cold. It's miserable. <laughs> Probably don't have much time left. Season might have already closed by the time you go this ice fishing out. or something. Yeah, yeah. Go get you a kit, you know, a case of beer. I know y'all like bush light up there. You know, I'm a little more of a Coors guy, but you know, go to sit out there on that ice hole and you know, drink you some beer with a little buddy heater next to you. But um, just appreciate everybody's been listening. Appreciate everybody that's been listening throughout you know 2023. Now we're here in 2024. Uh, it should be a really exciting year and. Maybe we can all kind of learn a few things from this season that we can then apply going to the next season in this off season. So, again, just appreciate the support. Appreciate y'all watching. Appreciate y'all listening. And uh, we'll have to catch you back here on the next episode from the Southern Outdoorsman Podcast. And remember, guys, y'all stay Southern.